The Primer, A Guide to the Truth, by Jivan David Budu. This book is my gift to humanity, and as such, will always be available free of charge to anyone willing to read it. Under no circumstances should any individual, group, or organization gain monetary profits from distributing this piece of literature. Chapter 1. What is everything made of? Space, energy, mass, time, and gravity, from a human perspective. Humans have always been fascinated with the night sky, and we've spent hundreds of thousands of years guessing as to what is really out there. The mystery and awe of the vast complete darkness peppered with twinkling light still manages to capture the minds of us all. Unfortunately, hundreds of years' advancement of our total knowledge on what lies beyond our planetary womb, and only a minuscule percentage of our species has acquired a fraction of the information literally available at our fingertips. One could compare it to being trapped in a house your whole life without knowing an entire planet exists outside of your walls. You might be wondering why nobody has made a serious effort to teach humanity these things. Some have tried, but all of them seem to find it difficult to explain the theories and equations in a way the majority can innately grasp. A mind optimal for discovering the mathematics of our universe is rarely optimal for explaining their discoveries to anyone outside of their level of study. The first two chapters are definitely going to be the most challenging for the average person because they are going to demand the most of your brains. Please take your time and really think over each visualization before moving forward. With that in mind, let's get started. Have you ever heard the term the vacuum of space? The phrase naturally leads people to assume that vacuum implies emptiness or a void of energy. But this is grossly misleading and categorically incorrect. What looks like a black, empty, vast amount of nothingness between the twinkling stars is actually a medium. The term medium refers to the fact that space is a low-energy membrane of some kind that makes up everything you see, interact with, and don't see in our universe. In fact, the terms space and universe mean one and the same thing. The universe is a massive membrane of energy from which the planets, stars, plants, and animals are made. To better see this, let's simplify things by starting with a bowl of water. Yes, a bowl of water. I want you to imagine a square bowl of water. The color of the bowl can be your choice, but you must be able to clearly see the surface of the water and any movement it experiences. Light the bowl as you please to achieve this. Do you have this abstraction, or idea, comfortably fixed in your mind? Once you do, I want you to place all of the fingertips of one hand in the water and wait for the water to become still. Once that happens, Quickly remove your fingers and observe the behavior of the water. Five rings of water should be expanding in all directions, interfering with each other and bouncing off the walls of the bowl, with the initial energy slowly dissipating until the water returns to its lowest energy state and remains still. Why didn't the water just keep rippling around the bowl endlessly? For those interested, friction converted the energy to heat as the water interacted with itself and the bowl while waves opposed or inverted to others cancel each other out. In order to visualize space, we have to treat the water differently than it would behave in the real world. Let's put our fingertips back into the bowl as we did before. This time, when you pull your fingers out, the energy you transfer to the water will never die out, remaining constant for all eternity. The bowl will also reflect all the energy, absorbing none of it. Pull your fingers out and observe. The interfering waves become increasingly chaotic until the origin points of your fingertips can no longer be found. The water surface should resemble water on the verge of boiling or simmering, a gentle, never-ending bubbling. If this image is proving difficult to fix in your mind, try using real water in a small pot and get it simmering so you can have a solid picture in your head. Once we're both on the same page, return to the imaginary bowl and I want you to peel the top layer of the energized water off and remove the bowl along with the rest of the subsurface water. You can think of the skin that forms on the surface of some soups to get an idea of what I mean. The peeled layer should be very thin, like plastic cling wrap used in the kitchen, and it should still have the eternal fingertip energy rippling through it. I find looking at this energized film of fluid to be quite beautiful. This is a very rudimentary representation of a thin slice of empty space. Not so empty, is it? 
Whatever created or caused the universe to come into being built this as the scaffolding that would house all of the particle energy we call matter. But what exactly is this particle energy that builds us and everything we hold dear? To understand that, we must return to our thin film of turbulent liquid in our mind. Do you have the rudimentary strip of energized space in your head? Good. Another property of space we must add to our bubbling water film is that nothing we know of can break or tear it. You may have heard in science fiction movies, TV shows, and or books that someone or thing tore a hole in the fabric of space. While it's a fun idea for storytelling, we have not found any means of achieving this in the real universe. The fabric or medium of space is so strong, even objects with billions of times more particle energy than our glorious sun can't achieve it. With all of that in mind, make your energized liquid sheet unbreakable. Now, give the bubbling sheet a healthy flick with one of your fingers. Things just got hectic in a hurry. Like the fingertip energy that never dissipates or dies out, the same goes for the flick energy. So what did you observe? First, all of the flick energy concentrated where your finger impacted the medium. Then it began to distribute itself around the rest of the film as it interacts with the fingertip energy. Your imaginary sheet of space should look like the surface of violently boiling water with these two energies interfering with each other. To break down what you are observing, the fingertip energy is the energy inherent to every infinitesimally small section of space. The flick energy flowing through your medium represents a fundamental particle of energy, such as an electron, photon, quark, etc. These particles that build us are actually tiny portions of excited space. However, unlike real space, our simulation lacks the dimensions that allow for a full three-dimensional medium. Let us fix that, shall we? First, I want you to make copies of your liquid sheet of empty space. Make it so you have a total of four energized sheets and make them so each one requires a different intensity of flick energy to activate a particle. Since this is all abstracted in your mind, make the intensities whatever you like. The intensities don't require mathematical precision, only general definitions you provide. You can even color them differently if that makes it easier. Play around with them until they can be conjured and comfortably manipulated in your mind at will. Once you feel confident with your four sheets, place them atop each other to form a thicker sheet. Pick one of the four flick intensities you selected earlier and apply it to the entire new layered sheet. All four layers will react and flow with the flick, but the energy will only have the properties of the layer you activated. If you add a second flick to activate a different layer, notice how the two energy sets remain within the layered medium, but they never occupy the same area simultaneously. And because they remain separate, they bounce off of each other constantly. The four layered sheet must look pretty violent with all of that energy occupying such a small space. Here on display is another fundamental aspect of space. Each layer represents a field of space, and space is built of numerous fields, many more than four. How many, you might be asking? We are not certain yet, but maybe one day we will know. What we do know is that every field of space can be excited in any empty region of space, and under normal conditions, the boundaries that separate different fields don't disappear. We'll get to the only time that changes later. Due to this structural aspect of our universe and its fluidity, the abstraction we're using is highly representative of what space looks like and shows how it behaves. Before we continue, let's do a quick review of where we are so far to avoid any confusion in the next phase. 1. We started with a bowl of water, added some energy to it through our fingertips, made that energy eternal, and removed the top layer of the bubbling water to represent a thin slice of empty space. Two. We then made that slice of space unbreakable while still allowing it to retain its fluid properties. 3. To represent a particle occupying empty space, you gave your slice a flick of energy. 4. Both the inherent energy to the slice of space and the flicked particle energy combined, making your slice of space look like the surface of boiling water. 5. After creating four slices of empty space and giving each sheet different levels of flick energy to activate that slice or field as a particle, you stack the four sheets on top of each other. 6. Lastly, you watch one of your four flick energies activate the entire four-layered structure, but the particle only has the properties of the layer you flicked. 
Activating other layers makes things more chaotic, but the different fields' particles never cross boundaries. Take a few moments and digest all of this to avoid any confusion before we venture forward. Back to building three-dimensional space. Start by taking your four-layered slice of empty space and replicating it many times. Stack these copies on top of the original and keep doing so until you have a cube. You should be able to see the numerous individual sheets lying horizontally, stacked vertically, and all simmering. If you apply a flick to one of the fields, you'll notice something strange. The flicked particle is able to move horizontally along the axis of the sheets, but it is unable to move up and down within the cube due to the orientation of the stacked fields. Let's remedy that. Duplicate the entire stacked cube of horizontal sheets. Using the new cube, rotate it so all the slices of stacked space run up and down, or vertically. If mathematical terms are helpful, the two cubes should now align perpendicular to each other at 90 degrees. Once these two cubes are set in their correct orientations, push them together so they merge and occupy the same dimensions. Looking at your new cube, it should look like a large cube made up of a lot of little cubes due to the vertical and horizontal grid formation. Well, what are you waiting for? Flick a field and see what it looks like. The energy can now move side to side and or up and down, but in order to move diagonally, it has to travel in both of these directions one at a time as if traversing steps. There is no direct path for diagonal movement, so we must rectify that. As you did before, duplicate your newly formed cube of horizontal and vertical slices of space. With the new copy you just made, you're going to do something a little differently than the last one. This time, keep the cube's position fixed as a frame and rotate the slices within it so all of them are diagonally oriented. Instead of the plus sign of the horizontal vertical cube we just copied, this one should be in an X-type orientation from any angle of view, only with a lot of X's. Your new cube should be completely filled with sheets of empty space running in diagonal orientation 45 degrees to the cube we started with. I'm sure you know that we're going to combine this new diagonally stacked cube with the horizontal vertical one, so merge them just like before. The newly formed cube, bubbling with empty space energy through each individual field, no longer appears grid-like. Instead, it should look whole as a single structure. Despite this appearance, each of the four fields we started this process with still retains its individual properties and can be activated with its specific flick energy as before. So give your new cube a flick. Have you ever seen a lava lamp before? You know, those glowing colored glass canisters with floating blobs of goo that hippies were required to own or they couldn't be a useless mooch on society? Levity aside, if you have never seen a lava lamp, try to find a video of one in action. Just as the blobs move freely as three-dimensional forms, so will your flicked energy dance through your newly formed three-dimensional cube. Sections break away and then merge back together. And unlike a lava lamp or their hippie counterparts, your flick energy moves at mind-blowing speed, with no time to call you DUDE as the energy darts around every available area within your cube. Our brains don't actually have any kind of reference for the speed at which all of this takes place, so do your best to approximate how rapidly all of this is happening. Now that we have created space in three dimensions, it is easier to understand the term vacuum of space. Vacuum means empty of our flicked particle energy and not total energy. Without any flicked particles of energy, the empty cube has all of the fingertip low simmering energy coursing through it just as you remember when we started with a single sheet of empty space. This inherent energy should look like a mild version of the three-dimensional lava lamp energy you just witnessed. Every flicked particle interacts with this energy, which creates the illusion of complete randomness. But that illusion is a human perspective. So we have three dimensions of movement through space and we're done, right? No, we are missing one of the most critical aspects to space, and that is time. However, time is one of those things that comes with a great deal of baggage. So let's traverse this course slowly. You may have heard at some point that we exist in four-dimensional space three dimensions of movement, and one dimension of time. This is true, and yet not entirely true. It's true in the sense that we move through time in one direction only, but I prefer to look at time as a field of space whose interactions prevent events from unhappening down to the particle level. 
Let's go deeper to gain clarity and return to our three-dimensional cube. Thus far, you have created three distinct cubes to grant your flicked particles freedom of movement as we experience it in our world. As you might have guessed, we'll need another cube, so go ahead and replicate your three-dimensional cube. This time, no rotation will be needed. Instead, take the four separate slices of empty space that we've been using to represent fields and turn them all into a single field. While this new three-dimensional field can be flicked, its particles flash in and out so quickly, they are of little consequence to our analogy. It is how this field interacts with the others that we are concerned with right now. You will instill this new field cube with the following properties. 1. Any field whose particles the new field interacts with will have a property called mass. Mass is what we call the measurement of how much interaction our new field has with any given particle slash energy or collection of particles slash energies. Do not confuse mass and weight as these are two distinct measurements that are not the same. 2. Any particle that experiences mass also experiences time. Particle energy that avoids the new field carries no mass and its life is without time. Massless particles also move at the maximum speed limit particle energy can travel in our universe, approximately 300,000 km per second, or the speed of light. 3. Because this new field physically interacts with the particle energy of other fields, and is made up of space, when this interaction happens, you can analogize it to space fueling itself up in the back of a station wagon under a starry... Wait, we're getting off topic. Basically, think of the new mass-time field cube as having fingers that prod and poke any energized portion of space that it can interact with. This phenomenon causes a certain amount of space to be moving inwards from all directions to grant a particle mass. These interactions are recorded as a snapshot of time, and the movement of space inwards towards the particle of energy is what we call gravity. Okay, that was a lot of information, so take a moment to let that digest. Clearly, this new field plays a massive role, pun intended, in how our universe evolved and why it looks the way it does today. In physics, this field is called the Higgs field. Another way to think of the Higgs field is to imagine the feeling of waving your hand through the air versus waving it in water. A massless particle is represented by your hand passing through the air. It feels free and has relatively low resistance. Photons, or particles of light produced by the electromagnetic field, are the most recognized massless particles to humanity. The resistance your hand feels while passing through the denser medium of water displays what a particle experiences when it interacts with the almighty Higgs. Electrons are the most recognizable particles with mass, though most types of particles experience the phenomenon of mass. In a sense, the Higgs field makes space more dense, providing a kind of friction for any field that it interacts with, and that friction has so many consequences. Mass, time, and gravity are all generated by the Higgs field, for without it, the universe would be nothing more than a gargantuan amount of oscillating particle energy freely moving at the speed of light, with no stars, planets, galaxies, or humanity. This is the reason the Higgs field is called the God field, because we owe much of our existence to it. As much as I would like to, I will resist the urge to get into too much detail on how many different particles there are, but it is important to have a basic idea of what atoms are, as they are the second level of fundamental building blocks from which we are built. An atom is what we call the most abundant organized arrangement of different fields in our universe. The simplest and most plentiful of these particle arrangements is the hydrogen atom so we'll examine it to give you a basic idea. Hydrogen atoms consist of an electron, a proton, and a neutron. We already know that an electron is a fundamental particle that has its own dedicated field. Protons and neutrons, however, are built of a collection of various fields. Protons and neutrons each contain three particles called quarks, two of them the same and one of them different. Physicists simplified things by calling one type up quarks and the other, you guessed it, down quarks. Each type of quark has its own specific mass designated by the Higgs field, with down quarks being almost double the mass of the up variety. Protons have two up quarks and one down, while neutrons have two down and one up, making it the more massive of the two. These quark groups don't just hold themselves together. Another field, physicists with a sense of humor named the gluon field, 
glues each triplet group of quarks together. The gluon field is also known as the strong nuclear force, and the particle it produces is massless. Yet its influence on the quark groups is so incredibly powerful that as soon as three quarks that can be bonded arise in the universe, the gluon field instantly binds them. Once that happens, it is extraordinarily difficult to rip apart a proton or neutron. And even if you manage to do so, the free quark is instantly bonded to another pair of quarks. Pretty crazy stuff happens at the smallest scales of the universe. Another field that interacts with our protons and neutrons is the weak nuclear force field, which has a variety of influences on atomic nuclear reactions. These three types of fields, quarks, gluons, and weak force, make up the nucleus of every atom in our universe. Orbiting the nucleus of our hydrogen atom is an electron. In most textbooks and various representations of atoms, the electron is depicted as a ball of energy circumnavigating the nucleus as the Earth does the Sun. It is therefore understandable why this representation gained popularity, because it is most easily comprehended by the general population. The more accurate way to see an electron in an atom is as a cloud of energy that surrounds the nucleus. Due to the effects of electromagnetism, the force slash field that generates light, the nucleus transfers a photon of energy to the electron, which raises the electron's energy level, and then passes it back to the nucleus, dropping its energy level. Each time the electron receives a photon, the size of the cloud increases, and the opposite happens when it gives it back. Another thing that happens when the electron interacts with the photon is, for the absolute briefest moment, the cloud collapses to a more concentrated packet of energy. This cloud collapsing and expanding is a consequence of particle energy and its interactions we call quantum mechanics. Due to the vast amount of information it would require to explain this incredible aspect of the universe when examined on its smallest scales, and the low amount of necessity the average person needs to understand how most of the universe and humanity functions, we're not going to go into it any further with this text. However, if you find the subject interesting and wish to learn more, you should definitely do some research on it. Truly mind-blowing stuff. I recommend a series of videos by Eugene Kuturiansky as a place to get a practical understanding of this incredible phenomenon. Perhaps one day I will add a chapter in a future revision. Another thing to note is the importance the electromagnetic field plays in every atom, which carries the magnetic charges we call positive and negative. The Higgs and electromagnetic fields are the two most important fields with regards to dictating the properties and interactions between the other particle fields. While this book is presenting a general hypothesis for understanding the universe, I freely admit that other hypotheses about the construction of the universe exist and may be more accurate from that perspective. There is a growing hypothesis about the universe being electromagnetic in nature. I can see the rationale of this argument, but it doesn't make as many accurate predictions as the model I'm using, so I haven't adopted it. However, I continue to examine the different ideas about our universe and test their predictive abilities as I move through time. And back to the atom. The ratio of mass between a proton and an electron is roughly 1,836 to 1, or something akin to a basketball and a few grains of salt. Just like these two objects, the amount of energy contained in each, and the amount of energy required to move them, is proportional to their relative mass. This describes how the Higgs field dictates the amount of energy required to move an object off its natural course or from a resting state. Now that we have an understanding of what a particle is, what space looks like, and how fundamental particles make up the atoms we're all made of, let's examine time, mass, and gravity and their relationship to each other before we close this chapter. So what is this time everyone is constantly talking about? If I were some dopey hipster, I would describe it as follows. Time isn't real, man. It's just an illusion created by the man to control us. These people are both ignorant and categorically retarded. Time is certainly not an illusion, and mankind has had nothing to do with its creation, only our perception of it. Time appears to be the imprint the Higgs field leaves on the universe when it interacts with energy at the fundamental level. 
This is why space free of particles with mass is also free of time, and why we can only measure time where particle energy is present. Think of time as a memory of the interactions which cannot be undone. As an example, once you've toasted a piece of bread, there is nothing you can do to untoast it. In fact, there is no way for you to go back and stop yourself from sliding the toaster lever down, or undo the thoughts that led you to deciding to toast the bread in the first place. As you can see, the train of causality goes on until you arrive at the beginning of the universe. Any descriptors past this serve only to convolute how particle energy experiences the phenomenon of time for the average person. What about gravity? A force so weak at the particle level that it is practically non-existent from our perspective. While on the larger scales, it can be so powerful, the fastest particles in the universe are unable to escape its pressure. Well, as we briefly alluded to a few pages back, the Higgs field adds mass simply by causing space to interact with energized portions of itself. Thinking of this interaction as a dominant field that pokes and prods energy allows you to visualize space moving towards particle energy the Higgs field interacts with. This movement of space also seems to have the effect of creating that imprint of time. The cool thing is, the more particle energy located within a given region of space, the more space is required to interact with that particular region. The actual number is for every doubling of particle energy within a section of space, the interaction space has with those particles increases by four times. Due to the fact that space is a physical entity, as shown using the cube abstraction, the space interacting with the added particle energy has to come from somewhere. So space around the doubled particle energy moves inwards toward the center of the total mass within that region of energized space. That's a mouthful, so give it some thought to ensure you understand what was described. Given that the nature of this interaction is that the Higgs field interacts with the energy in question and not the other way around, it is space that is pushing inwards and not being pulled. This distinction is very important, as you'll see in the next chapter, because most humans believe gravity on Earth is pulling them down when it is actually pushing you towards the center of the planet where the mass is densest. Yes, Isaac Newton had an apple pushed onto his noggin, if that story is correct. We will examine gravity on larger scales in the next chapter, but there is one last important aspect to these three phenomena, mass, time, and gravity, which this entire chapter has been building to, and that is their relationship and how they impact each other. Let's quickly summarize each. 1. Mass is a measurement of how much the Higgs field interacts with energy made from vibrational excitations of different fields of space. 2. Time is the imprint or memory of each minute interaction between these entities that make up our universe. 3. Gravity is what we call the reaction the Higgs has to a particle of energy. Double the energy in a given region of space and the force of gravity pushing in on that region increases by four times. This is where things get too cool for school. That's a literal statement because I don't know of a single educational institution that teaches this in the third decade of the 21st century before university. You see, as the amount of energy in a given region of space increases and the Higgs field interacts with it more, time in that affected region slows down relative to time outside of the region space is pushing in on. The closer to the center of the mass of the energy you measure time, the slower time moves. As you measure time further from the center mass, time moves faster in its passage relative to where you started. On scales beginning as large as moons and planets, the force of gravity extends well past the physical boundaries of the large body, otherwise known as a gravity well. Within the region of affected space surrounding the large mass, any particle energy moving through that region also experiences a relative reduction in the passage of time. And it gets even cooler. Turns out, the effect described above on time also occurs the faster energy moves through space. Remember, moving anything in the universe requires additional energy to combat the resistance the Higgs field provides. In this case, gravity is substituted for the speed of the object. This is what is described by the famous equation E equals mc squared. Particle energy's effect on space has a proportional effect on the passage of time. You're probably wondering, how do these interactions of gravity and movement through space affect time? 
The truth is, I can only hypothesize. It would seem that the more space interacts with itself, the longer it takes to make the imprint on the universe. It must be understood that these effects on time are infinitesimally small until you get to the extreme scales in our universe. For example, the difference between relative time from the surface of the Earth and the GPS navigational satellites orbiting our planet is roughly half a second. That's not a lot when you consider the Earth is pretty massive from our perspective. But without that knowledge and the human minds able to make these calculations to compensate for the difference, your digital navigation devices would be orders of magnitude off when positioning your location. Whether it is gravity or movement through space, the Higgs field alters the relative perception of time. You may have noticed the term relative being used quite often when referring to time. This is due to the fact that two energy sets constructed of the same amount of energy and organized in the exact same way will experience the passage of time differently depending on their individual level of interaction with the Higgs field. Object A, being completely motionless in particle-free space, will measure the passage of time as moving faster relative to object B moving very quickly through particle-free space. The same is true if object B is near a strong gravitational force. It is the amount of energy, which is to say Higgs interaction, that controls how any energy experiences the passage of time relative to another energy. And the reason motion affects time as gravity does is that to move any object from its rest position, energy has to be added to it. The amount of energy a moving object needs to affect time as gravity does is exactly proportional to the amount of energy needed to create that amount of gravity. This is why E equals mc squared describes both phenomena and provides accurate measurements in both examples. Finally, I have avoided using the term curvature of space and time to describe gravity as physicists do for two reasons. One, to avoid the natural confusion between gravity being a pulling force versus a pushing force. Two, to prevent people from seeing space as being stretched. It is not that the term is incorrect, it just leads to misconceptions if it is not fully understood. By the end of the next chapter, you will understand more thoroughly why I make these exceptions. For now, you have a general understanding of space, energy, mass, time, and gravity. But how did this massive universe we are a part of come to look the way it does? See you in the next chapter and we'll find out.